This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. It's six. Okay, <laughs> we're back with John David, that history professor at HPU, and we're going to talk today about China and about the limitations of what? Limitations of the limit, limitations of limits of Westernization. Westernization of China, which is, China, which is the title of my book. Studied up that front last year, time too. And there it is, and uh, yeah. So we're going to look at China today and. And look at really, China is so important today, right? Because China is the second largest economy in the world. You bet. And, you know, the Trump administration has made China an enemy. We just heard this morning that the Trump administration is going to abrogate the postal treaty with China. Well, Trump himself, I'm, I'm not sure he consults with anybody. <laughs> He's going to abrogate the, what the postal treaty with China, China postal treaty of 1874. Right. I guess I guess uh, that's been dwelling on his mind for some time, <laughs> and he's got lots of time to spend well, uh, reviewing the, the China Postal Treaty of 1874. It's, it's a little bizarre. One it is, has it to is admit bizarre. It's, it's a little bizarre because it's not going to affect U.S.-China relations no. at all. But uh, so uh, so when we think about China, uh, we have to understand that the China today is a recent uh, development. Um, it's not the China of the 19th century. Now, when we look at China in the really long view of history, we can see a China that was incredibly strong and powerful in the period between about 1500 and about 1800. Those 300 years, China, of course, went through two dynasties. It's right after Christopher Columbus. That's right. Um, but the Ming Dynasty in the 1500s, China was quite strong. And then again, in the Qing Dynasty from 1644 until uh, 1911, at times was quite strong. So China was a uh, China was clearly the largest economy in the world in that time period, 1500 to 1800. Was it as big as it is today geographically? Um, it was. It came to be uh, bigger actually mm -hmm. by the late late 18th century. By the late 1700s, China had actually expanded into Mongolia. And its, its western borders expanded dramatically. So there was right up against the Russian Empire. And the Mongols were kind of, uh, Mongol, they fought a significant war against the Mongols in that time period, uh, defeated the Mongols, and took over their territory. So What made them so strong and uh, what made them so imperialistic? Yeah. yeah, so their economy is very important in that time period because their trade is so lucrative with the West. The Silk Road. There's, there's the Silk Route and, and, yeah, the Silk Road. And then, of course, uh, there's trade via the port of Canton as well. And China controls the trade very carefully. Um, they, they, they're sending out tea because the British become enamored of tea. And the whole nation drinks tea by the late uh, 18th century. Uh, they're sending out silks. Uh, because the Chinese make uh, world-renowned silk clothing and silk, you know, silk all kinds of things. And porcelain. And porcelain is the third thing. They're sending out lots of porcelain. The porcelain that China makes is so valued that in Europe there are factories that make knockoffs in this time. <laughs> really? It's true, yeah. In Germany and France, factories are built to make China or Chinoese uh, porcelain. Chinois, yeah. yeah Chinois, yeah. right. And, and so you can, you can actually go to museums and see the comparison of the two. Yeah. Um, I think the Peabody Museum in Salem, Massachusetts, has both the German, the German knockoff and the Chinese <laughs> original. Great, yeah. <laughs> and what, this is 17th century, 18th well, century? Well, this is, this is actually from, uh, from the 1500s onward. Wow. The, the, the trade is constant. But I have a question about the trade, though. In order to get there from Canton to Europe, you know. Right. Um, you had a you had a you had a jump from one country to another. Yeah, is there was no uh, you know pure ocean route. That's you, true. You wound up going in a, into a port in Southeast Asia, right. Into a port in India and so right. forth. Right. Right. Um, so they must have also been trading. You know, like the Bermuda Triangle, right? <laughs> been trading. You know, from China ports to Indian ports, right. Right. and then from Indian well, ports to European ports. This, Jay, you're just getting so complicated now. This is very. This is actually very complicated. What what happens? Most of the traders in the early days of the China trade from Canton are not Europeans. They're actually Arabs, and the Arab traders end up near Baghdad, 
uh, they go into the Persian Gulf oh. from Canton. They oh. run down below the Indian subcontinent and yeah. enter the Persian Gulf. Yeah. And, and their goods go to Baghdad, and from Baghdad, they're transshipped up by land. through up, yeah, th by land up through uh, Europe. So that's also where the Silk Road ends as well. So it's kind of this common meeting point for all of the goods coming out of China. Very so, interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. <laughs> so, um, so the Chinese, in the long run, when we look at you know the last 500 years of history, actually, China has been preeminent more than it's been down on its luck. But of course, in the 19th century, what happened to China? Yes, it it declined. It did decline. And the jury needs to know why it declined and when it <laughs> right, declined. That's right. So, <laughs> so at the end of the 18th century, China is suffering so, from some real problems. Uh, their trade, the, the Europeans are tired of this one-way trade because China doesn't actually accept goods from Europe. They're only sending out goods, which means the inflow of silver is, is tremendous. The Chinese use silver as their currency. They need silver. And so they're not going to allow silver to go out. They want the silver to come in. The British pay in silver. So the, the trade is one way. This really makes the European powers angry. The British send a representative, Lord McCartney, to China in uh, uh, 1793 to beg the emperor to open up trade to British goods. The emperor says, hmm, nice guy, not interested. <laughs> After McCartney does the kowtow, <laughs> Actually, he doesn't do the kowtow. He does, the, he, the Chinese emperor says you have to do the kowtow before they meet. This is negotiated. Uh, McCartney says there's no way that I'm going to bow before an Asiatic prince. <laughs> <laughs> and so McCartney agrees to bend on one knee and, and bend like that before the emperor. Instead, of, the kowtow, by the way, is, was common practice for any a diplomat who visited, who got a, an audience with the Chinese emperor. The kowtow consisted of nine different bows done in proper order, uh. including a full prostration in front of the emperor. That's it, <laughs> face down on the floor in front of the emperor. So the kowtow was quite the thing. It was the symbolic expression of Chinese dominance. It was part of the tributary system that we talked about last time. China was considered the center of the universe for many uh, other nations in East Asia. So, so McCartney gets nothing. But at the same time, the British are penetrating into Chinese markets illegally. Uh, opium. Ah. The opium is coming in uh, uh, via boat and it's illegal. Gunboat. Gun, not gunboat at this point, just regular, regular it's East Asian, uh, the, the British East India Company is shipping in opium uh, There's illegally. There's nobody to stop them. Well, it's, it's, uh, there's a law against it, but well, and, and in, the, in the port itself, uh, what happens is the British East India Company drops the goods off on an island outside of Canton. Cute. Then, then pirates actually pick up the goods and bring them into the port. Contract pilots. That's right, pirates. that's right. But it becomes so open that in the early 19th century, there are all these warehouses, what are called factories, at the port of Canton, owned by uh, European merchants, and they're filled to the brim with opium bowls. <laughs> these big opium bowls, that's how opium is shipped. So the problem for China here is not just the trade, it's the addiction. Uh, the bureaucratic class, the civil bureaucrats, the scholar bureaucrat class of China is now addicted. We think a quarter of the scholar bureaucrat class was addicted to opium. So opium is coming from outside it's, China. It's, it's coming from, yeah, it's coming I remember from, it's in coming Afghanistan. from the British Empire. It's coming from Pakistan and Afghanistan. In, this, in Central is, Asia. That's yeah. right, which is a part of the British Empire by this time period. So, uh, and there are a few other places coming from Turkey as well. So, um, so yeah, so... So China gets into trouble. Uh, the British attack China uh, because of uh, the, the Chinese decide to take down the, uh, the, the warehouses, burn them, burn the opium, everything. The British come back in and say, no, you can't do that. That's our property. Uh, the British uh, send gunboats. This is when the gunboats come in. Mm. The British send steam-powered gunboats to China, uh, and they subdue China. China's forced to sign an unequal treaty in which everything that China does with the British now is favorable to the British and unfavorable to the Chinese. This is middle 
uh, 19th century. This is 1842. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, okay. and then what happens after that is a series of unequal treaties, a series of of foreign incursions, unequal treaties, and by the end of the 19th century, then China is divided up by the Europeans. Spheres powers. of influence. Spheres of influence. That's right. So, so into the 20th century, then you have China really on its knees. It's a it's a devastated power. Uh, the central government doesn't have complete control over the countrysides. A warlord control develops in the in the provinces, in the regions of China. And, and the British probably wanted that because that's well, divided and conquered. Yeah, that's right. It's a very divided place. Um, and so China needs help. Okay, it needs help. And in the 19 teens, starting at about 1915, uh, during World War I, uh, then young Chinese begin to be aware, they become conscious that China is strapped. China's in big trouble. And they begin to think about how they can help China. Intellectuals? These are intellectuals. It starts with the New Culture Movement in 1917, which, in which it's proposed that the Chinese language is way too complicated. And so uh, these intellectuals actually create a simple kind of peasant style version of the Chinese language uh, so that peasants can actually read newspapers and magazines and such. So, so how, how does that play with the, um, the decline of the emperor and the emperorship? Well, by, in 1911, the emperor is overthrown. And so in 19... That's because he was weak. Because well, because he couldn't control yeah, was, this foreign was, incursion. The, the, right, that's right. The Qing dynasty was corrupt and decrepit and had really lost its ability to rule by the time the, the emperor is overthrown. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it was bound to happen, and, you know, eventually because the emperor had lost legitimacy among, not just among people who opposed him, but among the wealthy, the powerful, the army. They had lost legitimacy among so all So he'd of become people. a kind of figurehead by that time yeah, anyway. That, well, yeah, yes, pretty much powerless. So, uh, so these young intellect, that's good context, by the way. These young, you're getting this. That's good. <laughs> just listening to you, John. <laughs> so... So and, these, and you know what? Yes. This reminds me we have to take a break. Ah, already. <laughs> really on a roll, you know. <laughs> Why stop? <laughs> this is John David Ann, and uh, this is uh, Lens of History, History Lens. And we're talking about U.S., China, and Japan, uh, a search for modernity today in the limits of Westernization. Take a look at that book, part two. We'll be back in a matter of seconds, uh, the history of a matter of seconds. <laughs> This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Freedom, is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others. And in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their lives. Aloha. I want to invite all of you to Talk Story with John Wahei every other Monday here at Think Tech Hawaii. And we have special guests like Professor Colin Moore from the University of Hawaii who joins us from time to time to talk about the political happenings in this state. Please join us every other Monday. Aloha. We're back. We're so happy to be back to follow the thread of history. History lens with John David Ann of HPU. So um, talking about intellectuals in right. China right. in the first 20 years of the 20th century, right. they emerged. And uh, my thought during, which I was wrong, my thought during the break was <laughs> that they must have come from the notion of intellectuals in Europe, ah, right. but no. No, that's not true. Chinese intellectual life actually has a much longer history than contact with the West. And so the scholar bureaucrats for centuries had intellectual salons. They met with one another. They would propose new ideas. They debated Confucianism, and they actually developed Neo-Confucianism. We'll come back to that in a second. Mm. Uh, but so in the early 20th century, no, there's this long history of Chinese intellectual life. Uh, and so a couple of very important intellectuals emerge. One of them is uh, Liang Qichao. If we can, if we can bring Liang up, uh, Liang is a young man, travels uh, widely, travels to the United States. That's actually Wang Yangming. Uh, can we bring uh, Liang up, the, the first picture there? There he is, Liang Qichao. Uh, and 
he becomes really the first Chinese nationalist intellectual uh, because he, he wants to rebuild the Chinese nation. That's a European he's outfit he's wearing. Dressed, dressed in a European outfit. The, the queue or the pigtail is gone. Uh, he has accepted this part. Travels to Europe, travels to the United States, travels to Australia. And his, his takeaway of traveling to these places is that imitating them blindly would be a mistake. There are things that the Europeans do well, and the Americans do, especially the Americans do well, and there are other things that they don't do well. Uh, Leon criticized the incredible poverty and the gap between the wealthy and the poor in the United States. He was disgusted by this. Uh, but he liked the political participation. He met with President Theodore Roosevelt. He met with J.P. Morgan, believe it or not. He was good. He, he, yeah, he was a prominent Chinese. Spoke English. Uh, Yes, his English was flawless. He wrote in English as well. So, so uh, he met with important officials, but he liked American political discourse. He liked that there was disagreement, that, there, that Americans seemed to be uh, civically minded, patriotic. Uh, this is a big problem in China. China's corrupt. You have a, an addicted scholar bureaucrat class. You have uh, the, the emperor has lost legitimacy. You have all of these warlords. And nobody talks about it. That's, that's, well, and right, before this time period, nobody had really identified that publicly as a problem. So Leon comes along and says, wait, we need to be loyal to the nation. We need to understand ourselves as loyal a, to the a nation. A kind of nationalism. Then. Yes, it's an early, it's an early patriotism. So where China. was Sun Yat-sen when all this was going on? Well, Sun Yat-sen was still around, actually. He was a contemporary of Leong. Uh, he was, Sun Yat-sen was busy building the nation. In fact, he, one of the pillars of Sun Yat-sen thought was nationalism, Chinese nationalism. And uh, uh, we, uh, Westerners have described this as Westernism, and it's not. It's actually Chinese oh, nationalism. Sounds like critical thinking the to limits me. of Westernization. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> True. <laughs> this is really important to find the boundary. That's right. So, so, so Leong does not say we should imitate the West uh, blindly by being more patriotic. He says we should look into our own past. And that's where Wang Yong Ming comes in. If we can pull a picture of Wang Yong Ming up. Uh, we'll who's about, not dressed in Western clothing. That's right. He's, he's this ancient uh, Confucian sage. Uh, and uh, it's that uh, first we, picture we, we were, saw. There, there he is. is. Yeah. So Wang Yang Ming. Wang Yang Ming lives in the same time period as Machiavelli. He's almost a, an exact contemporary of Machiavelli, late 1400s, early 1500s. Wang Yang Ming believes that uh, that. Uh, China has to be more ethical, that it has to be more uh, civically minded than it is. There's a lot of corruption at court in that time period. The eunuchs, China has all of these leaders at court who are eunuchs. The eunuchs are allied with the emperor. They're trying to seek the approval of the emperor. They become quite corrupt. Uh, and so uh, Wang Yang Ming is a kind of a voice in the wilderness, really. He's a, he's a prominent scholar bureaucrat, passes all of the exams, He's given important positions, um, uh, so but why but do we know him today? Right, but if he was a voice in the wilderness. Th that's I mean, right. How did he perpetuate his message? Right, that's right. So his message was that the Chinese needed to consider not just Confucian, uh, the proper dress of a Confucian scholar, or the proper sayings of a Confucian scholar, the externalities of Confucianism, but needed to consider the ethical basis for the for the empire. And the ethical basis was to connect ethical thought into ethical action. That was his philosophy. Where's Confucius in this? Well, Confucianism, this is a neo-Confucianism, so he's actually making a change to Confucianism. Mm, mm. Confucianism was all, I mean, Wang Young Ming did not reject the idea that the state should be run in an orderly fashion, that there should be an emperor, that the uh, eldest male should be the head of household. He didn't reject these basic Confucian premises, but he added something which was really against standard Confucianism, was that uh, thought into action and loyalty and civic responsibility goes above and beyond any sense of Confucian loyalty. Uh, loyalty to the household. Let's say your father says, it's a bad idea for you to, to go out and participate in this march. The march is a patriotic march. 
you could do, under Wang Yong Ming thought, you could actually do that in spite of the fact you're disobeying your father, which is against traditional Confucianism. But Wang Yong Ming said, for the sake of the nation, you can actually participate in that march uh, because uh, it's the right so thing to did, do. So it. did that remake Confucianism for China? It, for some it did. It became one of the schools of Confucianism mm. and it competed against other schools of mm. Confucianism. Mm. But the importance of Wang Yangming, so Wang Yangming puts down two rebellions in his time period. And these rebellions are because the emperor is not doing the service of his people. Okay, they're, they're actually kind of these popular rebellions. And he does it by putting thought into action uh, through his civic loyalty to the emperor and the empire. So he demonstrates his ideas as a scholar bureaucrat and, and as a leader to the, of, the, of the Chinese army in putting down these rebellions. So, so Wang Yangming thought comes into the early 20th century. Liang, who we saw earlier, is very interested in Wang Yangming. He's interested in the idea that Wang Yangming says that we should be uh, civically loyal, larger than ourselves. He, he, he translates some of Wang Yangming's work and calls calls uh, his conclusion, Wang Yangming's conclusion, civic virtue. The idea that citizens should be active in the life of their nation or their empire, that they should, they should contribute to the nation or empire, and uh, they should think in their minds. This is related to Fukuzawa last time. They should think in their minds, uh, uh, they should be independent thinkers about the, the good of the nation. Uh, so all of this idea of civic duty is it doesn't come from the West, actually. It comes from Wang Yang Ming thought, which is a big surprise, actually. I think most scholars today, if I was to uh, just make this statement that it comes from Wang Yang Ming thought, not from the West, they would be shocked by it. Yeah. And that's part of why the book is important, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and, so, and this began to change the way China thought. That's this, right. this had extension, this had traction, uh, and you can still see it. Am I right? Exactly. So there's another intellectual, uh, uh, Hu Shur, if we can bring him up, he's the next guy in line there. So uh, Hu Shur is actually, he's a full-on westernizer. He goes to the United States. There's Hu Shur. Uh, he studies He in, looks very western. Yes. He, he studies at Cornell University and then Columbia University. Studies under John Dewey at Columbia University. Gets his PhD in philosophy under Dewey. Um, eventually, he becomes the ambassador to the United States during World War II. He's a very prominent guy. But, so he goes back to China, and he's the one who starts the new culture movement in 1917. He proposes this new language, which is the language of the peasants, not the scholar bureaucrats, right, and so that common people can read about this. And he's one of the activists involved in the May 4th movement. May 4th, 1919, Chinese intellectuals take to the streets. They protest against uh, uh, the injustice that the Treaty of Versailles has done to China. The Treaty of Versailles gives the Shantung province to Japan. Uh, these intellectuals say, hey, this is terrible. We're being usurped again by the European powers and now by Japan mm -hmm. as well. So, so this, this protest movement they were begins. Action. They were action. The intellectuals were men of action. Actually, absolutely. Yeah, they were out in the street. They stopped traffic. They occupied Peking University so that the school had to shut down. Uh, they, they caused considerable distress among the leadership of China. <laughs> and you know, you'd, have, you'd have officials going out to beg, please go home, you know? <laughs> and, and these young students would say, forget about it, we're staying out here. So protesters often come and go without having a long-term effect. Right. Did they have a long, did Ming have a long-term yeah, effect? Yeah, so, so for one thing, Hu sure comes oh, into sure, the, yeah. Yeah, he, come, he, be, he becomes an important official in the Chinese government by the time he you know, becomes ambassador to the United States. Um, and many of these intellectuals become more radicalized. Uh, Mao Zedong is a very young man at this point and really kind of dismissed by the upper level intellectuals. But, he, but intellectuals begin to look at Marxism. They become very interested in the Bolshevik Revolution when it happens in 1917. And by 1921, there is in fact a Chinese Communist Party. Li Dashao is really kind of the founder of the Chinese Communist Party. 
He's a librarian. At it's Peking running a University. parallel to Russia, the and, intellectuals and that's Marxism. Right, and, that's right. And, wow. And, and, and so China has got this new life that's being breathed into them. Uh, but here's, here's an interesting problem for these intellectuals. Hu Xur is in, really in the, he says many, uh, Li Da Shao is a good friend of Hu Xur. Hu Xur is a westernizer, a liberal. Li Da Shao is a, a Marxist, a radical. And uh, they start to split, okay? These Western, westernized intellectuals and Marxist radicals split. Hu Xur and his crowd argue that, you know what, the place of the intellectual is in writing and in giving talks, it's not in protesting, it's not in politics. This is an issue for Hu Xur because Hu Xur was so powerful in the early 20s, if, if he had agreed to be more engaged in politics, I think he could have had a bigger impact. Maybe China doesn't go the communist route. Now that's a big statement and you know, there's a lot of other factors involved. It's hypothetical, yeah. Yeah, it's hypothetical. But so Hu Xur had this major, uh, poss this potential impact but he, he withdrew from politics. Interesting anecdote. When he's getting his PhD at Columbia University, there's this big women's march, 1915, very famous women's march for suffrage. John Dewey joins the march as it runs past Columbia University, who sure is looking out the window of his dorm room. He sees John Dewey joining the march and he writes, what a terrible thing for an intellectual to run out and protest <laughs> like this. It's, this is compromise of his position Yes, as an this is beneath <laughs> Dr. Dewey. So, so who sure was somebody who was not interested in politics, the rough and tumble of politics, and I think it hurt him. It hurt the possibility that China would become more westernized. But in fact, it represents a real limit on westernization in China in this time period. So. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah, I There's see. so many lessons that come from that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So where are we in the continuum, John? We're almost out of time. Right. Right. Um, so uh, okay, place us at a, at a year point. Right. Place us at a period, right. and then we can go forward from that next time. Right. So we're in the early 1920s, and China has become a republic. China has this new intellectual class that's clamoring for change, uh, but China is still dominated by w the Western powers. The British, the Americans, uh, the, the, the French, they all have troops in China. And that they, continued that, until the that, Second World War, didn't it? That continued right until the Second World War, yeah. And the unequal treaties continue right until the, the brink of the Second World War for China. So China's still got these incredible problems. And now Japan enters the scene in the early 1920s because Japan, during World War I, actually takes possessions. So they take Pacific Islands, and they also take possessions in China. And they have their most important possession, Manchuria, yes. which is in northern China. A so war even in the 20s, the, right? In the, in the 30s. The 30s. There's a war in Manchuria. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, so that's the stage for kind of the next act of these, these young intellectuals. And, and honestly, what happens next is uh, a looming crisis of thought. Okay. Uh, along with the, the economic crisis, the Great Depression, and the wars of the 1930s. Don't tell them anymore. Okay. Make it a cliffhanger. Intellectuals will. They become crisis-ridden themselves. Ah. Yeah. They, they, they're, okay. not, they're, they're confused by the okay. 1930s about this, this is going to be on, on the final is going to work. exam. The intellectuals become <laughs> okay. crisis-ridden themselves. We've set the stage for another great discussion with John David Ann. Well, Jay, I think you would soon. pass with a high B. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs>